you know, like I was mentioning before, that today is uh, the first Sunday in October, and we traditionally use October as a missions emphasis month. And so we are uh, doing that this month. COVID kind of put a monkey wrench in things, and so we got away from it for a few years because we couldn't have guests in that first year. But what we have decided on, I've got a video guest today. I don't know, is that video kind of ready to go? Okay, so these, you hear us talk about John and Kathy Graciano. They are good friends from Tacoma. We have taken kids up for years uh, during Easter week to, to do the mission, and they're going to share with us. They just happened to be, when I asked them to do this video, they were in Korea doing a conference, and so they're actually uh, sending us something from Korea. So let's just play that. We can just kind of hear the testimony. Isn't that awesome? They, they, are, they are incredible. They do so much. Um, and God is using them in a mighty way. And I just love the fact that we're connected. There's a lot of folks, we're going to hear from different folks this month, every Sunday, uh, that we're connected with, but not all of us are aware of the connection. So we're trying to kind of con bring the awareness up so that you guys know that they're, they're a part of us and we're a part of them and, and what they're doing. Yeah, that's kind of cool just to hear what they're doing. We're going to pray for missions here at the end of the service today. But I wanted to start with a testimony this morning. Uh, you know, when I was young, first a Christian, the first few years of being a Christian, I was in a church uh, that was very much focused on world mission, that we sent missionaries all around the world. And in fact, you've heard us talk about Spain. That's how Kim and I ended up in Spain, was being sent out from our local church. And we, you know, by the time I was 20 or 20, 21, uh, I had been in about, I don't know, 10 countries and, and had been a, across the United States in different capacities for missions, a part of short-term missions. So in us, right from the beginning, was a, developed a heart to, to care about the world, care about what God was doing in the earth and, and seeing that the gospel got spread in different places. And so we've carried that you know, just throughout all the years. And we have not, uh, in recent years here, we used to go, we've taken kids and young people and other people to very you know, various places through the years, but in the recent years, we haven't gone to as many. And so I'm wanting to see something, see, because there are others here that have that same heart, to, to do stuff and to see things happen in the earth and to be a part of what God's doing. See, we're a local church in McMinnville, but we are a world church, okay? So that's, that's important for us to understand, that, that we 
have to see ourselves that way because if we don't see ourselves that way, then nobody else is going to see us that way. And we, we, if we don't see ourselves as making a world impact, then we won't. And so we need to, we need to enlarge our vision for, the, for that kind of impact. And I wanted to talk this morning out of Acts chapter 13. If you're familiar with the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13 is the, is the chapter where the church at Antioch uh, it comes, uh, it comes to, to prominence. And now, what the church at Antioch was is a really a special church because what began to happen around Acts chapter 10 is that the Gentiles started to hear the gospel and respond to it, and the, Jew, and the Jewish believers, because everybody at the beginning of the church was a Jewish believer that believed in, in Jesus and followed Jesus. But from Acts chapter 10 onward, something began to happen, and it was this shift, and the message of the gospel began to be received by people who weren't Jews first. They were, they were Gentiles. They were Greeks, Greek-speaking uh, individuals from different places in, uh, around the... Wait till that goes by. Am I, am, I, am I moving something that I shouldn't move or doing something I shouldn't do? Or, okay, all right. Um, and so they, they, they began to follow Jesus. They began to believe in the gospel message. And so it created something, a situation that had never existed before then. Because everybody before then, they, they all had the same tradition, they all had the same beliefs, they all had the same history, and so they were all on the same page all the time because they, they knew where they came from, they knew who Jesus was, they heard the message, and then all of a sudden these folks that didn't have that background, didn't have that tradition, or didn't have that history, they started to believe too, and that's what began to happen in Antioch. There they, they began to be people that believed that were not Jews first. They were just people that wanted to follow Jesus. And so Barnabas was sent to that, to that area, to the area where Antioch is, so that he could begin to organize uh, you know, something to teach these people. Because there was, you know, we know like what we did this morning with the shofars and the history, there's a richer history that we can tap into. Uh, but but uh, if, you, if you don't know any of that, then you don't, some of the, the things in the gospel don't quite make enough sense. So you, you start to learn some of this stuff, and that's what Paul did, or excuse me, what Barnabas did. And when he got there, uh, he saw that there was such a tremendous need, he went looking for his friend Paul, or Saul, and brought him to Antioch so that they could begin to teach. Now we're going to talk about that a little bit more, uh, because really what I want to talk about is our calling to world mission, our calling and, and here's the thing, you may not have ever thought of yourself as being a missionary, but the thing about being a missionary is that we're all missionaries, we just don't know it, if you don't think you are one, because wherever you are, there is a mission to do. There is something that you can be doing for Christ. There is some way that you can serve the kingdom, and that makes you a missionary, whether you go across the world or not. You know, you can do it right here uh, in McMinnville. There are ways to be a part of mission. And, and, and that has to do with the sense of calling that we have. So in Acts chapter 13, something happened uh, that the churches at Antioch, which was this place that was all of, these, all of these people who followed Jesus that were not Jews, they began to gather and they began to form into a church there. And, 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 and the city church, uh, the, the church of Antioch, they got to the place where they had leaders, they had uh, ministries, they had gift areas, and, and people were doing all kinds of ministry. And then in chapter 13, verse 1, it says this, Now the church that was at Antioch, uh, in the church, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. They have, and then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Now, it's a little bit like what we did. I almost did it again. Dropped my glasses. I'm going to put them over here. Um, they, set, they, they prayed, they fasted, they set apart Saul and Barnabas. They sent them out. And this whole process, that was like a unique thing because these were not the original 12 apostles. These were a whole different group of Christian leaders. And so it, it represents a shift in the church. It represents like a next generation experience. Something was happening. And I think it's significant as we start to talk about, you know, how can I be a part of world mission? How can I do something for the kingdom? How can I serve Jesus in a bigger way? Uh, it's understanding something. What happened for, for Saul and Barnabas 
is that they were part of a larger group of leaders. And it was as they were all fasting, as they were all praying and worshiping the Lord, that's when the Holy Spirit shows up. So when, we, uh, when the leadership listens, prays and fasts, Holy Spirit speaks. There's something in that. Because um, the thing about sending is that over the years, I've, you know, I've, been, I've been a part of the church for a long time, so I've, I've been in a lot of different situations where different kinds of things happen in different, in different ways that people move on to the next thing in their life. And some of the ways they move on uh, is they, they use that expression, I feel like the Lord is sending me. Well, we don't send ourselves in any sense. You know, we just don't make a decision and say, I think I'd rather do that, and then we go do it. There, you know, people that aren't following Jesus, that's just like the normal way to do things. And maybe as Christians, we think the same. And, and in many ways, we, are just, we might use that language, but we're not recognizing that we're really sensing the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our life. But the, but the idea, if we have an understanding about how sending works, sending works when somebody else sends you. That's, how, that's what sending is. Sending is not me making a decision. And, and we want people making decisions about their life. We want people listening to the Holy Spirit themselves and following the Lord in something, whether it's going to a certain school, whether it's following a certain profession. Maybe you're supposed to live someplace and you feel a sense of the Lord. So it's not so much about that. But it's if in my understanding of my sense of personal call, when I feel like I've got this ministry, I've got this way that I'm supposed to be serving the Lord, and I don't understand that there's this cooperation that takes place between leaders, mentors, friends, people in my life, and that sense of call that I have, that I also am seeking the Lord. So we, we, we want to understand that there needs to be something of an impartation when people are sent. And that's what we did this morning. You know, the, the, there are those among us that wanted to be, that wanted to go to D.C., that, that desire in their heart. We had a witness that they were supposed to go, and we got, we, they were up here. We laid hands on them. We, we were sending them. And, and so that can happen in a lot of different contexts, in a lot of different ways. But it's different that, than just the decisions that people make for their life to kind of in a normal uh, routine kind of a way. But the idea of being sent carries with it a whole lot more of Holy Spirit's voice, Holy Spirit's impartation, that, there, that I'm not just going in my own effort or my own energy or in my own strength. I'm going with more import, imparted to me. And over the years, uh, I remember the first time I got prayer to go to do something, and I, was, I think I was 20 years old. And Mario Marillo, they were doing meetings all over the Bay Area, Mario kind of got off the scene for a while, but now he's kind of back on the scene. But uh, we were, he was doing something called Resurrection City out of Oakland, out of Berkeley University. And then he had a burden to do it on college campuses in the region. And so one of the campuses he wanted to do it at was the, the college that I went to. I, went, I attended San Jose State University. And, and so shout out from Peter in April, yeah. Uh, and so we, we, had a, we had a group of Christians that were meeting on the, camp, on the campus already. And so we became part of what Mario was doing in the region and to evangelize the campuses. And so I got prayer that I was going to be leading that. And so I don't know if you've ever had somebody pray for you for an impartation, for a, an anointing for a ministry. But that was the first time I had it done. I've had it done several times since then. But that was like significant in my memory because I got something. <laughs> something happened in my life and I... I just, I got woozy. I got, you know, I had to go to the prayer room at, right immediately after church because I felt like I had to figure out what was going on. And, I, you know, it was just like, it was one of the first times. But there is, an, there is something to impartation. There is something that when somebody has something, they can transfer some of that anointing to another person. And that if we are honoring that, we can receive that. And there's been other, other people who have prayed for Kim and I through the years that we know that we received something and that we want to be a steward of that. And that has to do with figuring out your call and figuring out what you're supposed to be doing with your life. Now, Paul, I shared that Barnabas went looking for him and brought him uh, to, to, talk to Antioch so that he could, he could teach, help him teach. And there's a, Paul has an interesting story because if, you, if you, you, you kind of go back to Acts chapter 9 when Paul got knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus and a light from heaven and the Lord spoke to him out of the light 
and he was blinded and he got prayer. He got, you know, you know, he was blind for three days and he got prayer and then he got the commission to, to preach. And so when he did that, after he did that, this is kind of what happened in verse 26 of Acts chapter 9. And so when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. That's because he'd been putting Christians in jail. You know, he'd been persecuting the church. So everybody hadn't heard that, you know, there wasn't an internet in those days, so that, that word did not get out very fast. And so people still thought he was chasing Christians. Uh, but, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. So he went to the apostles and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. So that's just the kind of effect Paul used to have on people, you know, that they, they wanted to kill him. They just like wherever he went, you know, he'd be preaching and then they, they, were, they were just out to get him because he made people mad. And so he was a very strong personality and he was untempered in any kind of a way. So he was out just telling people like it is. You ever hear people say that? Well, I just tell it like it is. Usually people that say that expression, they're usually making somebody mad. But, but Paul was like that. You know, he would just put it out there and people just did not like it. So when the brethren found out about all this, they brought him down to Caesarea and they sent him out to Tarsus because we figured this guy's going to get himself killed, so we better get him out of here. So what they did is they sent him home because he, he's from Tarsus. Paul, you know, Saul was from Tarsus. So they just sent him home. They sent him packing. And I just think it's, it's kind of funny because the Bible does, makes these jokes that you don't really catch unless you're looking for them. So they sent him out, you know, they got him out of Jerusalem where people are trying to kill him. They sent him back to Tarsus. And then the very next verse says, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, Samaria had peace <laughs> and were edified. I, I kind of think that's funny. Uh, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. So it's like the church was better off getting rid of Paul. Like they got him off the scene. They, they just kind of shipped him off back home and everybody was happier. Everybody had peace. The churches grew. Everything prospered. So, so I'm sure that Paul probably didn't think that things were going too good at that point. So you can have, you know, because we know from history, we know that later on he had the right idea, didn't he? He had a sense of what he was supposed to do with his life. So he had the right call, but he had the wrong answer. And that's really where a lot of us are. We have the right call, but we have the wrong answer. You know, we're, we're thinking that this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. How come it's not working out? How come I'm trying to do all this stuff and nothing's turning out for me? Uh, I thought this is what God wanted me to do. And so, like, we could be like Paul. So he just got shipped home, and, and, and he, it said that he was 14 years working on his message, the gospel. So that's maybe how long he was there. So finally, Barnabas, who had kind of taken him under his wing in Jerusalem, and then later got sent to Antioch, he remembers, who was that guy? The, the one that I had to get out of Jerusalem or else they were going to kill him. Who was that guy? And in verse 25, chapter 11 of Acts, this is, then Barnabas departed for, for Tarsus to seek Saul. He went looking for this guy that used to be the troublemaker because Saul was super well-educated. He was, he was one of the smartest guys of those days. He was like a master at teaching the law, teaching the truths of the Bible. And when he got saved, he put all that energy and all that education to work for the kingdom. And so when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So just a little bit of trivia. But Paul, who was put aside because he was trying to do things, but he was causing trouble. So the troublemaker got put aside. Uh, he had something in his heart, but it wasn't really connecting with anybody. So finally, years go by. He's tempered. He's maybe learned some things. And when it comes to Barnabas', Barnabas mind, Barnabas goes and brings him because he knows he's a great teacher. And so he brings him to Antioch, and he is used to disciple all these new believers. And he's teaching them the truth. And then it, you get to Acts chapter 13, and, and it says in Acts chapter 13 that while the, all of the elders and the prophets and the teachers were praying, they said, separate to, uh, unto me, the Holy Spirit did, uh, and two of the people that were there were with Saul and Barnabas, right? So they were part of that group. So I think it's really interesting because Paul 
got his ministry back as a teacher. That's, that was what got him into Antioch because he was such a good teacher. But as, he, as he's a teacher, other things are beginning to develop. His prophetic gifts are beginning to develop. He's starting to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit and to, and to share the revelations that he's getting. He becomes one of the elders in, you know, of the whole city church. So he, he's get, he gets promoted into eldership. So this is all part of his call. And then he gets, he gets uh, set apart as an apostle because that's what a, an apostle is, a sent out one. So Saul and Barnabas or Paul and Barnabas are sent out so that the apostolic is laid on him too. So Paul had this, uh, this diversity or this journey that he was on that he wasn't just called to be an apostle. I mean, we always think of him that way, you know, the apostle Paul. But he didn't start out that way, and that's not all he did. His ministry grew. It grew from year to year, and so eventually he, it wound up in an apostleship. But he had various assignments. He had various levels of authority and various levels of responsibility that kind of he traveled through. That's really important to understand when we talk about, you know, I have something I want to do for the Lord. That it, it, you don't, you know, you never start at the top. You never start anything, you know, doing exactly what you think you're going to end up doing. There's always a different starting place for us, you know, when we're trying to grow in the Lord. There's a verse in, in 1 Peter 5. It says this in verse 10. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. That's what happened to Paul in Tarsus. You know, he, he, he started out and he had the sense of calling to eternal glory. He said, I'm going to do things for the kingdom. And then he had to suffer for a while. <laughs> he suffered for a while. But then after he'd suffered for a while, he was perfected. And to be perfected is not means that like he didn't have any mistakes in his life anymore. It means that he was complete and that there was a wholeness that came into his life that all of the missing pieces that he needed so that he could become a whole person to minister from that wholeness, God established him, God strengthened him. And so within our sense of calling for salvation, there is a calling for the specific assignments that God has for us. See, we're all called. Every, every believer has been called. We've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've been called into his eternal glory. There is the sense of, hey, I'm choosing you. That's what it is to be called, that you've been chosen by God, and he brings you in to his family. But once you're in his family, the sense of, of calling expands. And so it's like, now that I'm called and I'm in the kingdom, and now that I'm a Christian, now that I'm following Jesus, I've, I'm, I'm responded to the call, but there's more call. There's more called in a specific way. How am I going to serve the Lord? What am I supposed to do? So how do we grow in that call? So within our uh, call to salvation, is there, there's, this, uh, there's this journey. There's this progression like Paul had. He didn't start out as an apostle. He started out as, uh, an, he tried to be an evangelist, but they sent him home because they were trying to kill him. And then he became a teacher. And then from a teacher, he becomes a prophetic. And then he becomes an elder, a leader in the church. And then he's set apart and he becomes an apostle and, and goes out and does ministry from that place of calling. And I don't know about you, but I kind of, I like to imagine, like, you know, like, how did it feel for Paul to get sent home? That's got to feel rotten. I mean, it's got to feel like, man, I messed up big time. So how does that feel? Because there are dreams in our heart. You know, I don't, I, I don't know a person who doesn't have a desire to do something or have a desire. They, they have something that they enjoy. They have something that they long to see. They, they're, they're just, something's in their heart. And, you know, we have dreams. And the dreams that we carry are the clues to our calling. Because a lot of times, the things that you really care about, the things that you really want to see established, the things that you long for in your life, they're the things that God put there. And, and uh, you know, I, I want to say not every single time, but often, very often. Because what can happen uh, when we, we're in our pre-Christ days, we might have desires and goals and things like that. But it, because they're not sanctified, uh, they're not always exactly, you know, what God has for us. But once we become a Christian, those desires, God wants to shape them. And our dreams matter to God. He doesn't want to just like to throw them all away. He wants us to, okay, let's see where you need adjustment. Let's see where your dreams can be refined. That's why Paul spent 14 years in Tarsus. He spent 14 years 
learning how to be a Christian, learning how to follow Jesus, and, and how would he teach this message. And so some assignments, you know, the dreams that you have, they turn into a call, they get the, the clues to your call, and then your call turns into assignments. Now, the thing about assignments is that you don't have the same assignment necessarily all your life. You don't, you don't, you don't start out like Paul. He started out as a teacher, but he didn't stay a teacher. He became more prophetic. And he didn't stay prophetic. He became more apostolic. It didn't mean that he set aside those things. He was always all of that, but God promoted him. And what we need to understand for our own life is that there may be things that we have as an assignment from God. You know, this is my ministry. This is what I do for God. And we think that that's what I'm going to do all my life. But you may or may not do that. You may, you may be a, through a part of your life, and then you realize that there's something that's more, something that is that else that you need to be doing. We, you know, Kim is in the art harvest. Bruce mentioned it. And to me, I thought of this this morning, because, but it's a, it's a great example of this. You see, we've, we've lived all of our lives, uh, Kim and I, uh, serving the Lord, involved in ministry, involved in missions, uh, involved in different various aspects of service, you know, with young people and with adults and with, uh, you know, small groups, all kinds of stuff. And then when we left the ministry the first time, I wound up being in business. And so we had our ministry kind of shifted. And so it was more the artwork. And Kim did more of the homeschooling, the, 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 the rearing of children and, and getting people all 20, 20 years of homeschooling. So that's a lot. Of, that's a long time for homeschooling with, with between four kids. And all through that time, she had dreams in her heart. There was something that she wanted to do. I didn't know. It. Most of the time, she never talked about it. But then in recent years, she starts to talk more about this dream this desire to do stuff with art. Okay, it takes courage to step out at a different time of your life when you think that, okay, I've already done everything that I'm going to do probably, and then so I just kind of have to start settling down. But that's not what she did. She kind of decided that she was going to go after this dream, and the Lord was in it. And it, there's been so many testimonies. Yesterday, this, it, you know, this is, this is a, a community thing. This art harvest is a community thing, but there are spiritual aspects to it. There, has, there was so much ministry that went on yesterday. There was three or four people that, that, uh, that Kim prayed for, that we prayed for. Uh, she shared some of the stories about the paintings, how they were developed, had people in tears about some of them. And there was just a lot of stuff that, that happened that was spiritual life, that happened in, in the day. And I think it's going to continue through today and, and next weekend. Um, and like Bruce said, you know, you, you, to do the whole tour, if you want to go to all the 60 or 70 artists that are involved in this, uh, you need a button. So that's 10 bucks. But if you just want to come to our house, you're welcome to come this weekend, this afternoon, or next weekend, you know, if, if today doesn't work out, uh, just to kind of check it out. Because to me, it's a testimony to this idea of call, that your call from God is something that you're going to carry your whole life, but your assignment from God is going to shift. You're, you're, you're going to be doing different things for him, but it's all going to be under the umbrella of that you're called to serve, you're called to do something in the kingdom. And... That's what we're really after. And if we talk about world mission, you're, not every one of us is going to end up in another country. Some of us will. And some of us may just have a heart for mission and just like praying for people and supporting people. But there's a way for every single one of us to be involved in what God is doing in the earth. That there, there are ways to do it. And if, we're, if we listen to our dreams, if we listen to our heart, and if we have courage, we'll step out to do some of these things and we'll have a lot of adventures that maybe otherwise we wouldn't have. So developing the authority, because it takes authority to really fulfill your call. Uh, how do we do that? John 8, 28 says this. Then Jesus said to them, he's talking to the Pharisees, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. In other places, Jesus said, I don't do anything unless I see Father doing it. And in other places, I don't say anything unless I hear Father speak it. That's when I, that's when I say what he is saying. So there's this idea that if we're going to grow in authority, there's a series of things. I teach this in freedom class, but I just thought I'd share it with you today. Uh, intimacy. You have to have a relationship with the Lord. Intimacy is the first step. You've got you to see him. You've got to understand him. Uh, th there's that the, the little phrase that goes with the word intimacy, into me you see. It's the idea of being known by God and 
seeing and knowing him too. That only happens through relationship. It only happens through the John 15 of being in the vine. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Me in Christ and Christ in me. That's the heart of authority. That if you get that one idea, that if I can focus on intimacy, if I can focus on being in Christ and Christ in me, then that idea is going to get me well down the road of growing in my authority, growing in my sense of calling. And, and, and so that if you step into this place and you really are pressing into a, a, an intimacy with the Lord, it's going to lead to humility. Because once you begin to see the Lord as he is, you begin to realize who he is, and it just like that just kind of naturally humbles you. And, and uh, in 1 Peter 5.5, 5, it says, In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. This is a New Living Translation. You know, this, this verse has become, as I've gotten older, this verse has become more significant. Because I think it really, it really is a good verse for every one of us to listen to. And all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And then verse 6, so humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor and give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. So this idea that, that if I'm going to grow in authority, I've got to press into intimacy, and I've got to learn from that intimacy how to humble myself before the Lord. And if you notice in this passage, it wasn't just humility before the Lord, because that's pretty easy for most of us, because we all kind of understand that the Lord's kind of better than us, right? The Lord is higher up than us. So humility before the Lord is not bad, not hard. But it's humility before others. That's the heart. That's the part that catches most of us. It's humility before others because we're, we, we have to learn to value the role of others in our life. And it's when we have that interdependence that things begin to happen. So the third area that if we're going to grow in our calling and grow in authority is we want to have some submission going on. Now, submission is basically yieldedness. Yieldedness. And I... And I like to call submission practical humility because you, you can be humble. I've got such a humble heart. You know, you, you, people talk about things like, oh, you know, that, that person is so humble. And we, we're really talking about their demeanor. We're really talking about their attitude. But practical humility, you know, how do you, what, do you, what does humility look like? It looks like submission. You see, we're yielding. We're just willing to do things. And, and, I, and I've used this phrase before, you know, with people. And I think, it's, I think this holds true in life, that we really don't know the level of submission we walk in until somebody asks us to do something we don't want to. <laughs> That'll tell you how submissive you are. Because if people are asking you to do things that you like to do, oh, sure, yeah, come on, that sounds like fun. We don't, we're right in, man. Sign me up. But when somebody asks you to do something that you particularly don't want to do or they, I don't know, maybe not, you know, then you still do it. Now you know where the humility is, where the humble ones are, because they're willing to step in those places. And they're willing to step into roles of submission in those ways. So if you're just looking for a clue, like you know, you're going to do a self-test or something, that's a good self-test. Uh, the fourth area that I want to develop so that I can grow in authority and, and, my, and in my calling is obedience. I want to follow him, follow the Lord with honor. I want to honor him, you know, because you can follow and be dragging your feet the whole way. Or you can follow with willingness and just honoring the Lord because of who he is. So Hebrews 13 verse 20 says this. Now, may the God of peace who brought us, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. There's obedience working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. There is something that happens in our obedience. There's, there's a, an authority release. You know when, when your kids are small and you know, they're, 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 some of them are outside, but you got one with you, so you say, go out and call your brothers in or your brothers and sisters in for dinner, and they go out there and with great authority, they just make this proclamation. Come in for dinner, you know, because they are confident because they have been sent with a mission. They have a commission to fulfill. 
and you've given them power. You know, you've, you've, you've invested them with authority in your name. And now they're going out into the yard and they're going to call everybody in. And you know, it's, it's a great big deal. They enjoy it. Uh, to, you know, ordering their brothers and sisters around. So that idea of obedience is where you know, it comes to the place and it results in authority in our life. So that if we're doing things because the Lord has led us to do them, built into that is authority. Because God doesn't ask you to do something and then just say, figure it out, you know, you know, you're getting no help from me. No, he says, if I'm asking you to do this, I will equip you to do it. I will impart to you what you need to do it. In fact, that's a good litmus test. Sometimes if you're involved in something and it's like, this is going absolutely nowhere, you ask yourself, did the Lord really ask me to do this? Or is this just my good idea? And, and it's a good way to check. You know, like, am I involved in obedience or am I involved in doing my own thing? And, and so you check. So th this progression, it starts with intimacy. It, it, it moves into humility. It moves towards submission. It moves towards obedience out of our submission. And then it moves into consecration. Now, consecration, if you've picked up that book, Miracle Work, in the book, this was like, uh, I, 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 I've uh, read through that. And that section about how we, we build power and authority in our life, it's a good, it's a good chapter. Uh, one of the things that I, I picked up from that is the, this idea of consecration. And it's the idea, I've never tied it to this in this way, but when we are consecrated to the Lord, things are happening. We've just spent most all summer talking about spiritual disciplines. And the reason we were talking about spiritual disciplines is because we are hoping to develop a heart that is consecrated so that we can grow in authority, so that we can be used in the kingdom to do stuff. And so consecration, Mark 9, 29, he said to them, this kind can, own, can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. You know, where is, where is the place of just the, the greater level of service? Fasting, extensive prayer, intercession, different kinds of devotion, different kinds of dedication that we would exercise in our service to God, they are part of the path that develops a greater authority. So when you are involved submitting your heart, you're involved obeying the Lord, you'll come to points of consecration. You'll come to a point where the Lord asks you to do something, maybe to give up something, maybe to set something aside in your life. You know, Maybe it's time for you uh, to grow up in a different part and God's asking you for something. He's saying, what, what about this area? And we make these decisions. At those points, it becomes consecration because you're only doing it because of your love for the Lord. You're doing it because you want to be used by Him. Maybe there's something that you really long to see happen and you feel like this is part of it. Now, we spent all those weeks talking about disciplines and we talked about training. We talked about what somebody who's in training, what they turn away, they turn away from so many practices if just normal people would engage in because they're, in, they're on a path. They're training for a race. They're training for something. And so they, they narrow their focus. So that's what we're talking about here. It's the consecration to just say, you know what? Some things just, they don't come out by prayer alone. Some things you got to fast too. So there's going to be things in your life that your normal Christian practice isn't going to be enough. You're going you're gonna to have to seek a, a higher answer. You're going to have to seek something else and let the Lord speak to you about what that is. Because I'm, I'm not going to impose anything on you, but you can... Seek the Lord and find out what, what is that supposed to look like in my life. So that's five. The sixth thing is character. Now, character is part of growing authority. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, it says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. That's Paul's admonition to the church. And character is, a, is being proven over time to be consistent over time. So you don't trust, you know, I've kind of beaten up this illustration in recent months, but, I can, but it's, it's just the, one of the best ones, is that, you know, when a ladder is rated, it's rated at a certain poundage. You know, you, get, you have a 200-pound ladder, but if, you, if you're 300 pounds and you get on that ladder, well, you're on your own, folks, because that's, you know, if that goes down on you, there's no, you know, nobody to blame but yourself. Uh, but you look for the ladder that's rated higher, right? You, 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 and how do you know that that ladder is going to hold you? It's because it's been tested. It's been proven. It has character. And we, in the same way, we are tested, we are proven, and when we are consistent over time and we are faithful over time, that shows that we have character. 
and that the Lord is proving our character. And other people are the best indicators of your character, not you yourself. You can say, oh, you know, I have a pretty good character. Oh, you know, that's, thanks. that's great that you have that idea. But it's the other people around you that are really going to know where your character is. And, and so let them speak into that area. But it, it is part of the development of your authority. It's for your call, to do your call. What are you called to do? And then the seventh thing, what will result from all these things as you practice all these things is that you're going to have increased influence. You're going to be able to reach more people. You're going to, the, the sphere of your reach, who you're able to touch is going to expand. It's going to extend out. Now, uh, most of us, we start out, we're just having to mind ourselves. You know, we're growing up and all you have to worry about is yourself. Getting yourself from point A to point B, uh, getting to school, getting to your job. But, you know, we start, we start uh, adding on. You know, we get married. We start having kids. And then our circle gets bigger. Now we have a little bit more influence. Maybe we get a pet. You know, we have authority. You know, we get, our, our, our circle is expanding. And, and so that influence is never meant to stop expanding. And so, like, if you have kind of gone stale, you know, if you're, you're like, you got that far, and that's kind of like, okay, now I'm done. You're not done. Because you're part of a kingdom. And in the kingdom, there's going to be expansion. And so you're supposed to ask yourself, how is my influence supposed to grow from here? And I, I just think that uh, that is an important question. If we're in a certain place in our life, we're saying, where is my influence gone? You know, how many people am I impacting? Whose lives am I touching? Now, there are seasons. Remember the assignments? The, the, some of them are for life. Some of them are for seasons. But there are some assignments that last your whole life, right? I mean, you know, we tell people, you know, we have all our kids are grown up, but we're not done being parents. You know, we're still, we're still parenting probably until we go. You know, and so it's just some assignments, they just last your lifetime. But other assignments, they're for seasons. And they will, they'll begin and they'll, they'll end. But they won't end in nothing. They'll end in an expanded role. They'll end in the next thing. They'll end, you know, maybe you go from teacher to a prophet to an apostle. And, you know, it's just, there's an expansion that takes place. So if your influence is expanding, it's going to result in transformation for other people and lives being restored around you. That's what fruit looks like in ministry, people's lives being changed. And that's what we want to see. Um, in John 15, verse 7, it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father's glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So fruitfulness is the result. When we go after our call, whatever that might look like, because in this room, there's got to be a, a, enough calls to go around that you know we're not going to be necessarily all doing the same thing. We're all going to be doing different stuff. But when we go after our call, people's lives will be affected. People will be changed. People will be saved. People will be healed and delivered and rescued in any kind of way that they're at because that's what we're called to do. So we have to ask ourselves, have I, have I settled in my influence? Am I like accepting that my influence is either just for myself, my, you know, that I just got to take care of myself and that's it? Because if you're, if you're a younger person, that's probably where you're at. You know, just manage yourself well. Uh, but then as you, as you start expanding, having kids, having uh, a family, then that, that, that influence increases. And it should be, you should be impacting the people that are close to you. But then it's beyond that. And it's more than just your friends. It's more than just the people that you necessarily just know. How are you when you go out in the community? Are you making an impact around you? And it doesn't have to, we don't have to all have the same impact. We just have to understand that we all have impact. And just let the Lord develop it. And, and whatever it's supposed to look like, that's what it'll look like. So are we willing to cooperate with the Holy Spirit so he can set us apart for the calling that he has for us to fulfill? That's a question that we can answer. Am I listening? Am I cooperating? Am I in a, am I in a family that they'll speak into my life and Holy Spirit can use them and I can listen to the Holy Spirit myself so that I can grow in my calling? Because you're not going to stay in the same calling all of your life, in the same assignment in your calling. You're going to grow. It's going to expand. So you may have more coming in your life than the current assignment indicates. So through the course of this month where we're, we're focusing on mission, 
uh, I remember, I think we have a video from last year, John and Kathy, when they, they said, we're, we're in Korea. Well, you know, 15 years ago, I mean, I've known John and Kathy for about 20 some years, but 20 years ago, they were not going to Korea. They had a, they had a, a prophetic word about fire, uh, a ring of fire in the Pacific Rim. That's all they had was a prophetic word about ministry in the Asian Rim. And it took about 10 years before that word began to materialize in their life with invitations to teach and invitations. And then finally, they wound up in Korea about five years ago. And now they're going regularly. Uh, that's how calling and assignment shifts through the years. And so if we're in a place, we need to see, God, what do you have next for me? What is my, how is my role expanding and changing? Then I want to be willing to be responsive to what it is. And, th and then those seven steps, that, that's when they begin to make, they, make, they begin to matter. Because am I developing my intimacy? And am I developing my heart of humility? Am I stepping into submission? Am I being obedient? Am I consecrating my life? Am I developing my character? Because if you're doing those things, you will be ready to expand your influence in, in the people's lives who are around you. Uh, and that's just basically, that's just how that works. Uh, so that's what we're after. That's what we want to see for everybody. You know, we want everybody moving forward, moving ahead in the things God has for them. Uh, let's stand. We're done. I preached long today. All right. Bless the Lord. <laughs> so I hope that made sense to you. And if it didn't make sense today, kind of file it because it will make sense at some point in your life. Because maybe you're not facing any transitions right now. But you will. Uh, you will. Yeah. Jesus, I thank you for your goodness to us. And I pray right now uh, for every person here, every person on Zoom, that God, that you would lead us to the next thing. That you would expand our influence. That, Lord, that you will increase our fruitfulness. And that, Lord, that we will be in the current assignment. That, Lord, that you will show us how we can be most effective Lord, we don't, we don't want to be sent home like Paul was sent home to Tarsus. Lord, we want to, we want to learn our lessons, and we want to be uh, fruitful in the place that you plant us. And so, Lord, we ask that you work in us so that you can expand the kingdom through us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.